Okay, so if we go on to the presentations, and um, we're going to start this, we're going to have um, three different presentations. Uh, first from Sarah and Ben Brumfield on audio annotate, uh, then from Nikki uh, on anonotate, uh, and then myself finally for IIIF Workbench. Um, so there'll be time for a couple of questions after each presentation, uh, and then we'll have a discussion at the end uh, about the different three different systems and also uh, what other possibilities there are with uh, this kind of methodology. Um, so if I can pass on to Sarah and Ben to kick us off. Absolutely. Get our screen shared here. So we're here today to talk about a project um, that we work on with a English professor, Tanya Clement at the University of Texas at Austin. This is funded it's the first phase of it was funded by ACLS, the American Council of Learned, Learned Societies. Societies. And then um, further funding was provided by the Mellon Foundation. So we're gonna start with a demo. So Audi Annotate was designed as a kind of bootstrapping program for um, scholars who are working with audio files that are online, but not IIIF enabled. So we want them to be able to use all the benefits of IIIF. Um, without necessarily having to run their own stack or uh, needing to be at the institutions that possess these. So Sarah's going to start uh, in the audio annotated web app, which is a Ruby on Rails web app that has no backing storage at all. There's no database behind it. It talks directly to GitHub via the GitHub API or to Git using a Git API. Um, this means that while this is running on our servers, anybody else who spun up the audio annotate software would see exactly the same data that we're seeing here, right? Because we're all talking to a group of, of repositories. So what Sarah just did is create a new audio annotate project that created a GitHub repository under her own account, um, which she can go and access. It instantiated that GitHub repository with a skeleton of a, a Jekyll site, right? So the, the goal is to have static sites that are presented on GitHub pages using Jekyll, data that's stored in GitHub, and only really need the Ruby on Rails web app uh, while data is being created, right? So, so the, those are kind of the three big pieces we're going to be talking about. So we kind of check the GitHub status, which is not always dependable because it has some lag time, but and we see that this is ready. So I'm gonna go ahead and open our project here. It won't have much in it, but. So now we have a GitHub pages site uh, presented using Jekyll. So this is, again, we want everything to be machine readable and human readable. Jekyll gives us the ability to do both of those things. So the next step is going to be creating an item manifest. And this presumes that there is already uh, some kind of wave file or MP3 file or something accessible online, but there is no IIIF manifest for it. We could also bring in an existing IIIF manifest now. Um, but again, the original design was for online audio or video material that was not IIIF enabled. So when Sarah saves this, this creates a IIIF manifest using the form input that she put in and stores it in the data directory. So now we have a manifest, and that manifest is accessible both on GitHub, as we see here, you know, we can edit the source and do whatever we want here. It's also accessible in the GitHub pages site, which if it's finished, it's, building, it's finished. It says it's still building. So. Yeah. Once it's finished rebuilding, uh, there also will be a manifest URL for this item. So Jekyll will be presenting just the raw JSON uh, to the, the end user Should and also to the consumer. Uh, let's, let's see if you go to the actual pages site first. No, Not still that. building. Okay. <laughs> still building. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and upload some annotations while we wait. So we've got a handful of annotations that were created offline, in this case using Audacity, but we can handle Adobe Premiere Pro and other things. And this takes you through an annotation transformation wizard um, in which we take a look at the spreadsheet or TS TSV file that you've uploaded. Uh, we identify which columns represent start times, which columns represent end times. Um, 
what has the textual body of an annotation, and if there's a separate column describing different layers, which should be uh, conceptually speaking, like Photoshop layers, there actually can be annotation pages, um, then you specify those as well. So Sarah's uploaded those. If we go to the IIIF, uh, so we reload this manifest here. This should have been updated to include a link to the annotation page that Sarah just created via her CSV upload. Uh, that somehow did not work. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's take a look at the page, though. Maybe the VMDs has to be up and going quicker than the site. One of the challenges that we find uh, using, there we go. Okay. One of the challenges that we find relying on GitHub pages is that while it works really well in a um, research situation, in which you have one person building a site, um, because the page builds, those Jekyll builds are queued by GitHub, conducting a workshop that relies on GitHub <laughs> pages can be really bad because you may have 40 people all firing off builds and what may be an acceptable, you know, half minute delay for one person, you multiply that times 40 and the person who started to hit the save button last, uh, you know, the workshop may be over by the time they're done. So, I've always introduced myself to this poem. Okay. You so, see, we play things. Right. So this is the human consumption of uh, these annotations. So we have a Jekyll template that is looking at that data directory at those JSON files. It's looping through all the annotations and rendering this uh, table for humans to consume. We should also be able to pull out the raw JSON files. Um, these are linked to UV, which is also consuming this manifest, but the manifest could be plugged into Mirador or anything else. At this point. Got, you know, your raw triple eyes manifest here. Zoom just got in the way of me switching to that, but we could switch and we could show you that, you know, we've got the raw manifest there that you can use elsewhere. So Glenn encouraged us to uh, list kind of open questions that we have. And Glenn, I wasn't sure whether you wanted us to launch into that now and kind of what the next steps are, what the things are we're wrestling with or wait until the other presentations are done. Do you want to say them now? We'll take note of them, come back to them. Okay. Said, said he, said, that, he said, if you want to say them now, we okay. can come back to them. Right, so one big question we have um, is, you know, part of the promise of minimal computing is the idea that very low resource environments the global south, you know, South Sudan, places like that can have the ability to use digital humanities tools uh, offline without having to have large servers and big IIIF stacks. GitHub is great in that being able to host things on GitHub and using it for storing your data means you don't have to have those things. But GitHub is also a problem because if the communities you're trying to reach are scholars in Cuba or Iran or other countries that are limited by American policy embargoes, they can't use GitHub. So there's this kind of paradox. We're not sure how to deal with it. We think being able to uh, have smooth paths to pull these sites out might be an option. Yeah, we were surprised when we started working on, um, you know, part of the, the appeal of using Jekyll-based static sites is librarians, when you talk to them, hey, this is static HTML, you don't have to be running a server in order to do any sort of preservation. Um, it's theoretically very easy to just to do a Git clone of this and hand it off. But if you want to be thinking, you know, five or 10 years in the future, what, what instructions do you give people to put with it? That was harder than I thought. Like I thought, oh, we'll just spend you know half an hour and we'll have this documented, and we don't quite have that done yet. <laughs> yeah, because what, you, what you'd like is for people not necessarily to hand people the source file. You want to hand them this that you're seeing, yeah. right? So that they can actually save the rendered HTML. Um, and handing them the step of saying, well, you know, do a Git clone and, and then, then do, do a, a Jekyll, Jekyll build, build and then archive what comes out of it. That's a step too far for a lot of people. And, yeah, we have other questions too, but I, we might be beyond yeah, our 10 minutes. Yeah, so. let's, let's 
switch to somebody else and then we can come back and I think we all have similar sort of questions. That's great. Here. There was a, there was one question from Joe in the chat. Um, okay. Have you looked at how this might work if someone does have a local server to work with, so a private version of the in-house work? Um, so I think there's two sides to that. So there's the running the server, which Audi Annotate, you can clone and run. It's a it's pretty lightweight. So absolutely, um, anyone could run this. It pushes everything to GitHub because it needs authentication and it needs a place to put it. But um, you can, you know, get clone it down to wherever you want and then do things with it from there. So you don't have to have GitHub be part of it has to be part of the initial flow. It doesn't have to be part of the forever flow. We have talked to other people who are interested in using it without GitHub, but that's kind of outside the yeah. scope of what we're building. There's also the option of using private repositories and private accounts, right? So you'd mm -hmm. use Audi Annotate to create something initially publicly, then you'd switch it to be a private project. And we haven't tried this, but in theory, you would be able to keep using the web app to, to write to a private repository so long as the API keep, you know, we, we use our accounts as we're logged in to access those. So we can, you know, we should be able to see private materials. Could you connect it to a local GitLab instance? Um, so the sides, the, the parts of this that use Git, yes. The parts of this that rely on the GitHub API to create the repository primarily or to pull the get pages sites, no, those would need to be changed. That's great, thank you. Um, so should we move on to uh, Nikki to talk us through a non-attate? Yeah, um, I actually have an answer to Joe's question with my thing, what actually came out of the fact that I had a local version that basically wrote files um, and it like spun up a vagrant instance. And that was too much for our, like to ask like any academic to do. They were like, uh, it, it was five steps I think for install. And they're like, this is too much for me. I, I, I don't know how to do this, which is actually how an annotate came out um, because my, my solution was just something that was not usable um, for, um, any of the, the, the professors at my institution. Um, so having a web application that they can just log into with a GitHub login was a lot more um, feasible for them. Um, so this is a nonotate. Um, this is the homepage. I'm still working on it. So it's not like fully stable. Um, development is still happening. But the idea is basically, um, you enter a manifest or an image URL. It works not only with IIIF images and IIIF manifest, but it works with uh, just regular JPEGs as well. Um, so if you look like these are just demos of like what you can do. So you could load a manifest or you could just load a, a IIIF image with the info.json or um, you can just load a regular image. And what you do is go ahead and annotate these images. Um, so, Actually, I need to switch uh, workspaces. So one of the upsides of a annotate is you can actually create multiple workspaces. Um, so if you can tell right here, this is my workspace and I'm gonna switch. This is the, the template that I fork from for everything. So I don't wanna add annotations there. Um, so as you can see, there's another uh, workspace here that I can switch to. Um, and I just did, and you can see the users on that current workspace. Um, you can also like invite people to workspaces. Uh, if I switch back, you should see invite collaborators. So if you're an admin on that workspace, you can invite people, you can rename whatever existing workspaces you have admin accesses, access to, you can create a new workspace. Um, so if I go back to the home page and Zoom is blocking, half of the menu for me. Oh. Uh, you can go to an image. Um, and as you can see, I already have a, an annotation on this image. Um, I can either edit this annotation um, or add a reply, or I can create a new one. And I'm just gonna create a new one, which you have to hold down the shift key and then you just drag. 
and that looks like a little boat and you can actually choose um, a purpose if you want to and you can add tags some ocean um, you can add multiple tags and you just click OK. And then if you go to the annotations tab, you will see a list of the annotations. Um, so it allows you to create an annotation. It automatically creates an annotation list and it creates a single annotation. So if you go into single annotations, it'll give you a link to just each annotation as a single annotation. Um, and it also gives you a list. And as you can see, these are the GitHub URLs. So if you actually open this, um, sorry, this link, it will actually give you a link to that JSON with the GitHub URL. Um, one of the ways, as you can see, I think there's only one annotation in this GitHub URL right now. Um, one of the ways I got around caching is use uh, session storage. Um, so basically every 35 seconds, I think, it checks the API. What I ended up doing is not using the GitHub API. I ended up setting up an API on the the, cause I'm using a Jekyll, uh, like Jekyll site to build um, the website. And if you go to the homepage, it's just an API. Um, this is one of the ways I got around um, just rate limiting with the GitHub API. I didn't wanna like overtax the GitHub API. So I basically have it build an API um, for the application to use. Um, you can also create like custom views. Um, so one of the reasons we wanted to actually have our professors be able to start creating annotations is I built a application that allows you um, to view annotations, which kind of cart before the horse, but <laughs> I went backwards. Um, this is that application and we wanted them to be able to, to use this in our high tech spaces, which we have like 365 degree view spaces where these actually fit, like I built it so it's responsive. So it'll work on your cell phone screen and a 365 degree view. Um, so you can like tab through annotations um, and see everything. And so we wanted our professors to actually be able to do this. Um, and I built the application to have a number of like custom settings that you can use. Um, so this actually allows you to, like if you wanna make a custom board, like so maybe you want, the annotations to show up, um, let's see. Uh, maybe you want like, there's like a, if I should, okay. If I tab through, you can see there's this little box. Maybe I want it to be a collapsible view and not show up like that. And this is what a collapsible view looks like. It's just like that. Um, and you can actually save this view to the website. So if I save it, and go into list custom views. It's gonna tell me it's still rendering. Um, I can also delete it from the GitHub website as well. Um, and it eventually will show up and it'll give you a URL. There you go. Um, show up on a website. Um, Additionally, there's the ability to create collections, which is just the ability to have multiple um, views in that storyboard view. So if I wanna add, should actually already be a collection there. Um, there's already a test collection here. Um, so this is one annotation and it's just an image view. So there are multiple views within Anona. Um, and then I can tab to the next view and you can add as many views as you want into that, uh, into that storyboard view. Um, and again, it creates a, a, a page on your website. Um, the other thing I'm working on right now is integrating Wax. So this is my local instance. Um, so if I switch over to Wax, what it ends up doing is, taking a while, um, there we go, uh, is basically everything in WAC shows up in your, um, here. Uh, you can also, one of the things I'm working on is 
processing a wax collection. So basically what you do is you upload all the images via GitHub. Um, I couldn't figure out like a better way of doing that. Um, put them in the folder, uh, upload the spreadsheet. And what this will do is automatically process uh, everything. And then also if anyone's familiar with wax, you have to add like three different things to your config in order to make it searchable. Uh, this will automatically do that using the, the data from the yeah. spreadsheet. Um, maybe maybe can you, you can explain what WAX is other than the kind of OG that we're all using as our inspiration for, for all these tools? Uh, yeah, WAX is like a, it's a Jekyll site that's a, like a collection management. Um, so I can show you my demo WAX site. Um, just give you like a idea of what wax looks like. Uh, so basically you can have like a collection, um, you can have multiple collections, um, and then you can have exhibits. Uh, the wax integration I'm working on right now uh, custom views get written to exhibits. So basically you can have like a custom view be your exhibit um, and makes your collection searchable. Um, this is basically wax. Um, and then uh, core to annotate, you can actually upload images and uh, create a manifest with an existing IIIF image. Um, and the newest integration has it where if you create annotations on anything, it will automatically write the annotation list to your manifest. Um, so it automatically gets added to that manifest as well. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, there's this help link. There's an entire site devoted to like how to get started um, and pretty much all the, the functionality on annotate. Um, and I'll add a link to, to that in the chat. Um, I think that's it. That's really great, thank you. Um, any questions? Nope, well, more chance to ask questions at the end. Um, so finally, I'm just gonna talk about uh, something that we've been using for the training. I'm afraid I was not brave enough to do this live. Uh, so you'll have to do the screenshots. I admire you all for doing it live. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna talk about the IIIF training workbench, which is something that we've been working on, uh, very inspired by the previous two projects uh, and using GitHub for storage. Um, so we do this training um, roughly every month uh, and it's split into a five day course. Uh, day one is just how to use IIIF viewers, how to take manifests and, and open them up in various viewers. Um, day two is all about the image API um, and as well as them giving them kind of an optional task to go right in there and install their own image server. Um, the one thing that we ask them to do is use the Internet Archive um, because this is quite an easy way for people to uh, use any image uploaded to the Internet Archive and they get a full um, IIIF image uh, for free, which is which is fantastic. Um, then day three, we look at the presentation API uh, and we start by using the Bodleian Manifest Editor. Uh, and that means that they can take their Internet Archive image uh, into the Manifest Editor and then create their own manifest. Uh, and up until recently, we've been using something called a local Chrome web server. Uh, which is something that attaches to your Chrome browser and gives you like a mini web server attached to your machine, uh, which has generally worked out really well. Um, and then day four, we go into annotations and day five, we get them to uh, demo what they've been working on. Um, but the issues that we've come up recently is um, we really like to move our training to version three of AAA. Uh, and the Internet Archive currently only offer um, version two AAA images. So that was one motivating factor. And the second bigger change really is um, everybody's moving to HTTPS and encryption, um, which is great and fantastic, but it causes real problems when you're trying to run things on localhost on a non-encrypted server. Um, so all of our manifests um, that we host using our local Chrome web server, um, there's only certain tools that you can use them with. So we set up um, versions of our own version of Mirador and the Universal Viewer, which isn't on HTTPS so that it can use their manifest, but really, 
as part of the training, we'd like them to be able to use it on any IIIF tool. Um, so they're the major kind of driving forces for why we um, started creating Workbench. Um, and the idea is that you can upload images, uh, manifests and annotations, uh, and it will convert the images into level zero IIIF images and store them on GitHub. Uh, and also it will give you public URLs for your manifest annotations uh, and in the future collections uh, using GitHub pages. So similar to the other, um, other examples. Uh, and as I said, I'm too scared to this live. So I'm gonna take you through the um, screenshots. Um, so if you go to the workbench, um, it asks you to log in with your GitHub account and you can sign up for one um, if you haven't got one. Uh, then when you log in, you're asked to create a project. Um, so when you click the create project button, this will um, create a repository in your GitHub account in the background. Um, so I'm gonna create one uh, about space. Um, you have to be really careful about spaces. I don't know if everyone else has come across this, but if you put spaces and certain symbols in there, it causes no end of issue. So um, that's something that we've had to uh, test against, but I've created my um, project with space the word rather than space the character uh, and it's fine. Um, so this is switching to another user, which has a number of different um, projects um, or repositories in GitHub. Um, so I've created space, and if I click that, uh, I get taken to um, the images part of Workbench. Um, so I've uploaded three images here already, um, which happen to be a, a Ganymede, one of the, the moons of Jupiter. Uh, but you click the upload button, uh, and it gives you the option to select an image from your computer. Um, rename it uh, if you need to, um, to give it a kind of a URL safe um, name, and then also select the um, version of the image API that you want to display it in either two or three. Uh, at the moment, we're focusing on two, but um, it means that later on we can switch the training to three uh, and this should continue working. Um, so you click that and upload, um, and after a certain period of time, um, it will upload the images, it will split them to tiles, and it will send it to GitHub. Uh, and then it will update the GitHub pages so that you've got your um, IIIF info URL uh, working. Um, it's difficult to predict. I found exactly the same problem as, as others with um, GitHub pages. Um, it takes roughly about two or three minutes for the upload uh, and the sending to GitHub, depending on the size of the image. Um, but generally in the training, we get people to do this in their own time. Um, so it's not such a problem with multiple people doing it at the same time. Then once you've uploaded your images, um, you can switch over to use the um, Bodleian Manifest Editor to create your um, manifest. Um, so I uploaded the three images. Um, I've linked each one to a canvas. Um, you can see there are some issues with using a level zero image, particularly in, in this one where the, the thumbnails aren't showing. Uh, but the image itself um, works fine in the Manifest Editor. Um, so I've added my three canvases. I've added some metadata. Uh, and then you can download the manifest to your local machine. Um, there's an interesting still manifest remotely feature, which might be something uh, that might be useful to add in later. Uh, but at the moment we ask people to download it uh, locally and then switch back to Workbench uh, and upload it again. Um, this again gives you a chance to rename it because all of the manifests that come out of the body of manifest editor are called manifest.json. So it gives you a chance to rename it. Um, then once you've, uh, it's uploaded and it's checked to see if the GitHub pages has updated, uh, a number of icons appear. So one for Mirador and one for the Universal Viewer, which means you can just click these links uh, and you can see this level zero manifest uh, in Mirador 3 uh, and also in the Universal Viewer. Um, the thumbnails weren't working uh, last time I checked this. So that's one um, change in the UV recently, which means that level zero thumbnails now work, which is, is great news. So the next part of the training is um, annotating images. Um, so we run a, a copy of the simple annotation server for the training, uh, and you can take your workbench manifest into the simple annotation server, uh, which runs an older copy of Mirador, which again, you can see the thumbnails aren't working for level zero, um, but you can start annotating. Um, so I've just created a box and I've saved the annotation. Um, and then once I've done that, I can, use one of the features of Simple Annotation Server, which allows you to um, download the annotations. So you um, view the annotations, find your manifest, and then you can see all of the annotations you've got. So you can right click and save this, and this is a, an annotation list. And then switch back to uh, the workbench and upload the annotations a similar way you did to your manifest. Um, and then this is enough for it to be able to work in the NOAA. So you can take that URL of the annotations list 
uh, and dump it straight into a NOAA and you can kind of whiz around um, the image that you've been annotating. But if we want to make it usable in Mirador, unfortunately, we have to do a bit more um, fiddling. Um, this is quite useful in the training because it uh, kind of encourages people to start editing manifests and to try and uh, get into the JSON. Um, so the thing we need to do here is link the uh, annotation, the manifest to the annotation list that we created. Um, in the simple annotation server, we've got some instructions about where to put it. So we can just copy this um, segment of JSON. Uh, navigate to the correct place in the manifest and paste it in um, to link to our annotation list and uh, making sure to use the URL uh, of the GitHub version of our annotation list. Um, so now we need to replace the version of the manifest in the um, in GitHub. So we've edited it locally and we need to update the GitHub version. Um, so in the training, we tell people to delete it and then re-add it, but I'm just going to click the edit manifest button. Um, which kind of dumps you straight into GitHub um, and allows you to edit, which is, you know, it's quite a nice uh, little feature. Um, so you can hide GitHub completely, but sometimes it's easier just to dump you straight into an editable version. And because you're lo already logged in through the application, uh, it doesn't ask you to log in straight away. Um, so I've copied and pasted my manifest into this and I've gone down and clicked save. Um, and then Assuming you get around the whole caching issue um, and you realize it's, it has been updated. I really like Nikki's idea of the API, uh, something I'm definitely going to have a look at. Um, but assuming your annotations, your uh, manifest has been updated and you've got the latest copy, uh, you can go back into Mirador um, and you can see that the annotations you've created um, are appearing. And so you've got this really kind of interactive uh, manifest with three images, annotations, um, all zoomable all using GitHub um, hosting uh, for free, which is going to be really useful for the training. And just looking quickly at um, how the repository looks in the back end. Um, so you can see we've got a directory for each of the different um, top level sections in the, um, in the application. So one for your annotation list, one for collections, which isn't implemented at the moment. Images, which is your level zero images, manifests, uh, which are the manifests you've uploaded. If we look at the manifest, you can see this is the Ganymede um, manifest that I uploaded. It also creates a IIIF collection, um, just so if you want to view all of your manifests, uh, you can take that collection.json and, and view that in the UV or Mirador. And then the images, which is slightly different, um, we have a manifest for all of our images that were uploaded. Uh, and if you look in these directories, you'll see all of the tiles um, that it created uh, and that are stored on GitHub. So looking to the future, um, at the moment, uh, here I've got this um, files thing at the top, um, and I'm thinking that maybe that might be a way to kind of put in a template for, say, um, Mirador or the Universal Viewer or maybe a NOAA, um, so you can embed those clients straight into your um, GitHub Pages website. Uh, at the moment, you can just browse around what's there, but um, that's something I'm looking into the future. Um, I want to improve the Jackal website, so similar to uh, Nikki's example and, and um, Audio Annotate, I have a basic Jekyll template, uh, but it'd be great to make that more functional and maybe Wax is the answer, and that'd be really interesting to explore. Um, improving this edit manifest workflow, there is an issue with this kind of editing and the GitHub pages caching, uh, which I'd like to improve and then support for collections. Um, then I've got a couple of links here, which I can put into the chat for the um, live workbench. Um, the generated repository and also the source code uh, if you wanted to run your copy yourself. Um, so I'll just pause there for questions. Um, let me stop share. Hey, Glenn, I had a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. It was unclear from the screenshots is is there an application and a Jekyll site and what was what was in which one so I think almost all of the um pages I showed you were all the application um so the Jekyll site looks horrible um <laughs> so I haven't shown it to you um so the Jekyll is um I'd like it to be able to so you go to your um github uh, web address and you'll be able to see what images you have loaded um, but that's not possible at the moment. It's kind of like a very basic Jekyll page. So not anything I've shown you so far is, is the Jekyll part. Yeah. Right, so shall we go on to discussion? And I think um, Peter's got a good question to start us off. Um, 
So would it be discuss, worth discussing a common GitHub repo format for IIIF resources um, so that a repo created by one of these tools could be worked on by any of the others? And I also think it's a good idea about what this, do others think. Nikki, are you using Jekyll really? I guess the wax piece of it, you are. I, mean, I feel like- No, the basic part is also using Jekyll because the idea is basically if I decide to stop supporting an annotate at any point, um, which was like some of the pushback I got when I first proposed this project was we don't want to host anything. Like my institution did not want to host anything and did not want to deal with like having to export everything if we end up deciding to stop hosting something. So my solution was was Jekyll, especially since GitHub pages automatically rebuilds Jekyll when you push. Um, so yeah, the Wax is just another Jekyll site that works with an annotate. Um, but the original, uh, the original is not like a Jekyll site where like you have like collections where like you can view anything. I'm just using it basically as an API and to have URLs for all your JSON stuff that you're creating. Um, I didn't really see the point of like anything else just because uh, an annotate kind of does the reading for everything. And I think if I ever do like make it not available, I'll just send out some templates and be like, upload these and it'll do what the site does. Um, but I figured it would increase lag time in terms of rebuilding it if I did anything for me. Where I was, well, go ahead. Well, where I was going with that was this idea of a common GitHub repo format for IIIF resources. I know where our kind of where we're putting things within our GitHub repo is very much driven by Jekyll. Right, right. We, we have this need to do Jekyll side rendering, right? We're not presenting JSON that's, you know, JavaScript that's consuming JSON for presentation. We're trying to be able to read these web annotations. And triple F manifests. And triple F manifests and present them in these HTML pages. And that means we kind of, so far as we understand Jekyll, we kind of have to tuck them off under this underscore data directory so that our Jekyll templates can read those to produce the static HTML. And I'm not, sure that that's appropriate for uh, either either Glenn or Nikki's uh, setups, right? They, they have much simpler structures that we would frankly have preferred to use. I think we started out using some other structures too, and we ended up with our triple life data where it is because it's the thing that gave us the best access to it using Jekyll's liquid syntax and stuff. I think it depends. You don't have to put everything in underscore data. Um, the way Jekyll works is you can do a, site, a collection. So Glenn and I have almost exactly the same format, except for I put my annotations in an underscore annotations folder and he just has a straight annotations folder. Um, and the reason I do that is Jekyll has a collections thing. If you look at my API, it's pulling all the data from those annotation files. It's pulling all the content and the front matter. Um, oh, you're defining them as Jekyll collections, and okay, we 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 should go do some research. On well, that. part of it is is how much work are you going to put into your your Jekyll theme? Do we? This is yeah. this is this like actually kind of yeah, yeah. This could get us over a couple of of things we're doing that are kind of hacky. Yeah. So cool. Good yeah. question, Peter. Um. So I think most of what I. I I think, yeah, I think Glenn and I are almost exactly the same in terms of formatting because I don't really need to read manifest content. So I don't worry about putting that in a collection. But if you if you put something like just as a file, you can't actually read it within Jekyll templates. Um, but if you do put it as like a collection, um, which is just adding that underscore and then adding something to the config file, you actually can read all the content in the front matter and it acts the same as like data, so. Well, Peter, did you want to come in on that at all? Yeah, I guess I, I still have a big learning curve ahead of me on this, um, but but it does sound like we could isolate the the triple IF content within uh, one of these repositories and, and format that the same way, so annotations go in the annotation folder and so on, and drive the uh, the the GitHub pages based API from that using GitHub's Jekyll. So we're, we're committed to Jekyll there. And the rest of Jekyll would then be available for anything uh, project based 
and we would have clearly delimited which parts are have to be have to conform to our standard format to, to drive the triple if part and you're free then to add special pages for the project in whatever way you want as long as they don't clash and that's that would mean a, a, a single site could could have the kind of rich annotation support that an annotate is providing and the audio annotate and 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 space all in one go uh, that that would be pretty cool yeah that does sound really cool yeah i don't know how you're you're determining because i i'm using like i don't know how glenn or sarah are determining like what uh repos are like I have something in the description field that basically tells me this is a known annotate. This is an annotate repo, because um, otherwise I'm going to be loading every repo, which for some people is not something you want to be doing. So that's something you also have to to think about in terms of like how do we, in terms of standards, like how do we determine, like so that all these repos know to read, like only these ones. Yeah, we use a tag. Um, yeah. Even tag repos, so we yeah. had an audi annotate tag. Yeah, GitHub's topics API support was was in beta when we started this, and so you know the audi annotate web app that shows you all the audi annotate projects out there. It's just doing a GitHub search for anything that's tagged with audi annotate as a topic, and I think that might be something that would be interesting to standardize for things like annotation discovery, if we said. You know, this contains IIIF resources. It's not just some random repo of, of you know, somebody's software project. Uh, if we came up with a set of, of uh, these tags to stick in that topic field, uh, that might really help us out. Yeah, I actually avoided tags because um, you have to do it. If I'm just going through every repo, if that makes sense, that belongs to the user um and going that way and that way doesn't involve like topics and tags aren't included in that api um and i don't know if you're having problems when you search for the topic of access like are you loading a, how, how do you determine whether the user has access to to those repos? so we show two things we'll show every project that's public in GitHub that's got a topic of Audi Annotate on, we didn't show that in the demo today, on the kind of main page for Audi Annotate. That's getting clunky as we do more workshops and things, right? You know, how many of these projects do you want to show there? Um, we started hacking it by starring them and we'll, we'll show the ones that are most starred at the top. Um, and then when you click on my projects, then we show combination a combination. Yeah. There's there's a nice quick query that shows you all of the projects that you own that are tagged with Audi Annotate. Um, and then we had a lot of trouble using GitHub's API to get a list of organizations a user was part of. Uh, so we have to do some kind of ugly n plus one looping to look for Audi Annotate projects that are that that the user has access to contribute to because of their organization membership. Yeah, that's why I avoided topics and just went with through the, the user's repos because that also gives you the organization repos and all the private repos. Um, so that kind of just avoids all that, which is why I use the description field because I didn't want to make a bunch of calls. Um, maybe theoretically GitHub API might include topics, um, but right now it's not. You, you have to make a separate call to get the topics for each repo, which is annoying. Yeah. So I, I use the GitHub API and I use the topics because I copied what uh, you did with Audio Annotate. Um, I haven't tested with organizations or private repositories, so that'd be interesting to test if, if mine will pick them up. Um, but it gets a list of your personal repositories and then looks for the tags to see if it's in there uh, to add it. Um, but it'd be interesting if, if we can get the tagging to work, whether we can tag, if we manage to make, say, Workbench, Audio Annotate and uh, an Annotate compatible, with a tag that's shared between the three. Um, and then I should be able to pick out your repos as well as the ones I've created. You know, we had some of the driving ideas behind using GitHub in addition to not having to store data locally was if the idea that you could enable collaboration through GitHub's collaboration models. 
And we went down multiple paths with that, including, you know, fork a repo and make changes and then do a pull request. And we, we, we documented that and we had some, I think some of our GRAs work through it and- Tried it with some existing scholars and- No, I mean, forks and pull requests are not something that most academics want to have to wrap their head around um, in order to do collaboration. But we did find that if you had, you know, repos that had multiple people had right access to, then you could do more collaboration. We haven't really pushed that side of it a lot, but that's definitely what we want to do. Yeah, that's how workspaces work within um, an annotate is you can, like when you're inviting a user, you're using their GitHub username and just basically like we're using the API to, to do that for people so they don't have to like go into the GitHub repo. And so I wrote that down because I'm like, we should do that too. <laughs> so yeah. Great, and I wanna ask uh, one of my own questions for him. I ask uh, Ronald's question uh, and I think it's an important one. What do we call these type of interfaces that use GitHub as a backend? There, there should be some good name for it, but I don't know. Is there one? And if not, we should make one. <laughs> we should get uh, our PI, Tanya, is much better at these naming <laughs> things than we are. So, no. Okay, and this is in the notes document. <laughs> on to uh, Ronald's question. Um, following on from Joe's earlier question, uh, might there be any interest in testing similar approaches with GitLab, including uh, to open up options for local copies archives? I haven't looked at GitLab at all. Mine's very tied to GitHub. Um, I don't know what the others think. Yeah, like everything, it's a funding question when you write the grant proposal two years ago <laughs> you decided to, to, to what you know then so. I think the answer is yes there would be interest and I feel like the kind of work that would be needed would be labor intensive but straightforward right you look at every place that you're using github specific stuff and you see if you can find the equivalent in GitLab and then implement it there with a switch right so totally possible totally out of scope of our current project i don't know about about mid year run go nikki <laughs> um i don't really know that many people who are familiar like within academia most people are familiar with github i don't know that many people familiar with gitlab um so it'd be pretty niche and I'd, I think I'd have to see like enough people that are like I want this um for me to be like yeah I'll, I'll integrate that I don't have the same problem in terms of funding and my job's flexible enough that they let me go pursue my passion projects which this is um but it's also there are like a number of like wax integration and we're talking about integrating with the three projects here today and this would be pretty low on my priority list considering how few people I know like use it. If I may, that's, that's fair enough. Um, at Cambridge, um, we, we had started with GitHub but ended up with GitLab after evaluation, other things. GitHub is still used, so they're both in operation, but officially we're doing more with GitLab. Um, maybe that's a, a local thing, but um, just thinking ahead of uh, data, data cul-de-sacs, um, you know, GitLab being having the opportunity to run locally. So I appreciate that. A lot of this starts with not running locally, but having that option and hybrid cloud uh, modalities, just thinking through for the future. But interesting, we are where we are. <laughs> I will say, um, I'll put a link in the chat. Uh, this is the code that Anonotate is based on. It's out of date now, um, but it is like a local instance where you can download it and either put it on a server um, or put it like just on your, like have a Vagrant instance running and it writes the files to your machine. Um, so I think there are ways of doing this that like involve a local instance, but the like thing I was trying to solve was 
for people who don't have resources or the technical know-how. Um, so I think there, I think there are resources out there that will do what you're talking about already. Um, and I'm not sure like these projects are necessarily looking to, to solve those problems. I'd say that at least from Audio Annotate's perspective, while it would be, so while we tried to design this with the philosophy that the entire file system not hosting the code could be wiped out between every browser request and nothing would matter, um, it does occur to me that you could set up an Audio Annotate project on a server, have it talk to uh, GitHub, and then go into kind of our, our temporary Git directory, create a new remote that pointed to GitLab, push everything to GitLab, and then delete your GitHub repository, right? You, you could do stuff like that if you needed to. I, I think we've got a couple more questions, time for a couple more questions. Um, so if there is one, please put it in the chat, but uh, I'll ask one about um, the search API. Uh, and the GitHub um, search API, uh, so the Triple F search API and the GitHub search API. Um, so, in Bennett, I think I saw on a previous um, presentation you were thinking about integrating this potentially um, to wrap the GitHub search API to present the Triple F search API. Have you thought further about this, Nikki? Do you think that would be of interest? Is is the problem because you know, if you have a IIIF search API endpoint, it has to point to some kind of shim that's going to translate between the two. And that shim would have to be a server that's up and running. Um, and if our whole point is that once, you're, once you've done all this work, you can shut the server down and still have a functional site, I'm not sure that that is- and You could run it as like a dynamo somewhere that only got spun up when this search was, I mean, but again, that's not how, we, that's not the architecture we've been driving towards with all of this. So we're, we're kind of thinking that maybe instead we should all discuss patterns for using something like the GitHub search API to look for annotations on a particular manifest or annotations with a particular content. Uh, and then define here's how to use this other API that's not triple IF, doesn't implement triple IF search. Here's maybe open source libraries to write your own shim or something. We're just, we're just not sure what the right approach is. Well, and so we actually, I mean, we have a real use case. So we've been working, part of this, the bigger grant project is working with um, AVP and their aviary um, audio and video repository. And Part of what we're getting to towards the end of this grant, which has still got a couple of years, is uh, to give them the ability to say, okay, we have this triple IF manifest, let's go query and see if there's any projects that have been built around it. And then let's bring the, the annotations back and give the repository owner the ability to review them and choose to integrate them or to link out to them. Um, to, to use it to enhance their, their holdings, right? Um, so that's, that's the use case we're working towards. How we get there, we're not, we haven't yeah, done all the work not, yet. <laughs> not sure. Yeah. Um, Anonate already has search built in. Uh, searches, you can search based on facets, facets um, based on creator. So you can search like if, if you're the, and it automatically puts that creator information in based on your login um, and writes that to the annotation. So creator tags, um, and then you can search the content on the annotations as well. Um, so that's already built into project, it. By project mm -hmm. basis. Like, like do you have to know that the repo exists and which one it is to do that? Or is it more You just more have to like, uh, in your workspace, you can search all the annotations in your workspace. Your annotations, yeah. Yeah, it's for annotations, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, but it also, like when you go to the annotation you're searching for, or like whatever you're looking for, it will show you what manifest that thing belongs to. Um, it will show you what custom views like that annotation has. It will show you what collections that annotation belongs to. All that is listed. Um, and the, 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 I mean, I can, if you don't mind me sharing screen, I can show you. Um, do you use the GitHub search API or do you index it in your application? Since I have to, 
um, basically put all those annotations into, I put it into a session. Um, since I have to do that anyway, I just use what's in the session. Um, so you can actually search like everything I've written test in and it'll show me all the results for test. Um, I can, and if I go into test, it's gonna show me, um, there's a display URL, there's a GitHub URL, it's part of this list. Um, I can build a custom view and if it had custom views and um, everything, it would show me that as well. Um, so, um, and you can delete and I'll show you everything. Um, so these are all the annotations I currently have. And you can see there are one annotation with the tag of Ocean and two different creators. Um, now this really kind of brings up the difference between search and discovery, right? Because you can search your project, but you cannot discover annotations from other projects this, with this approach. Yeah, you can only, yeah, you can only basically anything you have access to. Um, it's not going to allow you to, to, to view other people's if they don't want you to, basically. Well, thank you. That's perfect timing at the end of the top of the hour. So thank you both uh, to all the presenters. It was really, I found it was useful and I hope everyone else did as well. Uh, I think we can continue the discussion uh, on the Triple F Slack channel. Um, yeah, and I, I look forward to discussing it more. So thank you all and I'll see you again soon. Hi all, thank you. Thank you.